This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 184 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. Old friends and some new ones. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Question Collections offers a whole universe of shopping at your fingertips. Visit them at equestriancollections.com. Plus, Kentucky Performance Products, simple solutions scientifically proven on the web at kppusa.com. And a brand new sponsor today, and that is Equity Manufacturing at equitymfg.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the Stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hail or high water, while using their tails as their own flight swatters. Sit on down and laugh till your poop calls. It's time again for Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. This is Glenda Geek. And this is Helena B. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, howdy, Helena. Hi, Glenn. I am really excited that we have a new sponsor. I know we have a new sponsor today, and, and I want to remind everybody, if you would like to sponsor the Stable Scoop Radio Show, drop me an email at glenn with two N's at horseradionetwork.com. See, I got the plug in. I always forget you that. You did, and you, <laughs> told, you put your plug voice on, too. I did. I got my uh, big <laughs> your, announcer voice on. What, what is that? What are they called? Auctioneer? Yeah, you know? that's right. Whatever, 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 whatever. If you want to sponsor the Horse voice. Radio Network. <laughs> We always forget to do that, to tell people that they can advertise on our show, and it's affordably effective. It is affordably effective. Glenn and I were just talking about this this morning. You know, we we have uh, we do run the Horse Radio Network, um, but we also have, or I do anyway, some uh, businesses on the side, and I'm always looking at effective ways to advertise, and I am always surprised at how expensive advertising is in the horse industry, whether it's like, for, forget about print publications. Oh my goodness. Even just two lines in a classified in the back of a magazine is a couple hundred dollars. It's crazy. And nobody ever looks at it. Right. Um, you know, and then even banners on websites, $750, $1,000. And I'm thinking none of these websites have the kind of traffic, you know, and that, that could warrant these prices. And then you can't even, they don't even track it for you. You know, if you put an ad, you take an ad out in like, you know, one of the trade magazines, uh, Equine Journal or Yankee Peddler or something like that, you have no idea how many people are looking at your ad, but you, you know, you write that check every month. That's right. Then I thought, well, wait a minute. I should just advertise on my own gosh darn network. <laughs> there you go. See? I mean, seriously, it's affordable. You can track it. Yeah. We have like, 15,000 monthly subscribers who are really interested in horses and horse stuff. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. anyway, it was just, you know, no, I'm not actually trying to plug our advertising. I'm just, I never really thought about it until Glenn and I started talking about it this morning. And I just realized how effective podcast advertising is and that's why we've had you know some of the companies have been with us for three years and that's why they stick with us they wouldn't if it didn't work you know so like equestrian collections who's on here today like kentucky performance products who's on here today so this is not a big ad we do have a guest today um we have a terrific guest today that you you set up and uh we actually have met him and we've been out to that place here in kentucky just uh, give us a brief uh of who's coming up on today's show I I will. Um, Yeah, we're going to talk about friends, new friends, old friends. Um, In particular, we're going to talk about old friends. It's old friends retirement facility. Um, uh, They take on pensioned thoroughbreds and uh, they're based in Kentucky in Georgetown, Georgetown, Kentucky, which, of course, is Lexington is the thoroughbred capital of the world. Actually, and we're, we're actually about five miles from this farm where we live. And it's a it's a great place to offer retirement for thoroughbreds. And the way that Old Friends came about was that um, uh, some of you may know about the Kentucky Derby, Derby winner Ferdinand, who ended up in a Japanese slaughterhouse. And uh, right after news broke about Ferdinand's fate, uh, Old Friends began getting hundreds of emails promising support, asking how they can help. And so they came up with a plan to bring all at risk or as many at-risk racehorses as they could. You know, those whose racing and breeding careers had come to an end. So um, it's, it's not 
necessarily a rescue, but it's a retirement home. Yeah, it's and a retirement home. They, they actually, also they don't rehome them. They just home. live there and no. in, in uh, beautiful green pa- pastures the rest of their lives. Yep. And yeah, and then Mike Blow so, and they make it this, available. Is it from up your way, Boston? He is from this way. Yeah, yeah. you know, see, we're good-hearted Yankees. Uh, we Yankees are good-hearted. <laughs> um, so uh, they they decided to. Know. Not only is it the. Re- well, yes, stop. I can't get a word in. Edward. Do you see this? Maybe this is why we can't get advertisers because people are sick of listening to you cut me off. Go ahead. Sorry. I wish, you know, at this moment right now, I wish we were on video because if people could see my hands and my facial expressions, they'd be like, yeah, you're right, Alina. Anyway, sorry. old friends is great. They're open to the public so you can go and you can meet these wonderfully amazing X racers and lend your support and go home with a bigger heart for having met uh, a thoroughbred hero. And we're going to talk to Mike Blowen, who is the president and founder of Old Friends. Neat guy. And then also, I have an update on a product that we highlighted. Uh, uh, well, actually, it was a show I wasn't on. It was you and Jennifer were on, and you talked about the illuminated hoof pick. Remember that uh, from a couple of weeks yes. ago? Well, we yeah. have a story about how good the Illuminator Hoof Pick is. When it's kind of a gross story, but we'll tell it anyway. And then, uh, and, and then we're also going to meet our new sponsor, Joseph Berto, here in just a minute. And why don't we just get to him now, and then we'll be back with Mike Blowen, uh, president and founder of Old Friends here in Kentucky. All right, we have Joseph Berto on here, who's president of Equity Manufacturing, and we want to welcome you as the newest sponsor here on the Stable Scoop Radio Show. We wanted to talk to you a little bit today about some of the products you've got. Oh, wonderful. I'm really glad to be here, Glenn. And, and uh, it's like, how could I pass up the opportunity to advertise on a show whose name kind of describes one of our best-selling products, <laughs> That's which true, is the manure actually. fork, you know? That's true. That's true. And, you know, there's nothing better than Helena and I like to talk about than manure. We yeah, do. We Poop go. humor never gets old here. It never gets old. We're the only radio show in the world that can get away with that, talking about manure and, you know, abscesses. It, um, it can really set you up for a lot of ridicule, though, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> tell me a little bit about your horse history. You are a horse person. Well, I've been an inventor for a lot of years, and I have more than a dozen patents, and, and I've been inventing products into uh, something I'm interested in. For instance, when I was logging, I had products for uh, for chainsaws, in fact we still do, called whole shot filters. And then I moved into um, the snowmobile industry and I made a lot of products that people knew as, as whole shot products. Then I went into the helicopter industry and I made products for that. <laughs> okay. And then I kind of semi-retired and I met my wife, that was 15 years ago, and became a horse husband, which you can relate to. Yeah, a little bit. And um, she was horse crazy ever since high school when I first knew her. And um, of course, when you meet somebody like that, and then you get infected, and then you're into the horse uh, horse uh, business. I have no idea what you're talking about. Although, yeah, no. Right. I, <laughs> horses, helicopters, same thing, you yeah. know. Well, kind of, <laughs> yeah. Logical. They're expensive, and they can become a passion. But I can tell you, if, if, as far as I'm concerned, I would rather be on the back of a horse than in the seat of a helicopter. So I, I'm so uh, in love with riding horses that it really has been the, the major driver in my life. Well, depending so, on what and, kind of horse you have, again, very little difference. It's, it's <laughs> like riding a helicopter. <laughs> you could be flying in either way, huh? I'm kidding. Yes, I'm kidding. <laughs> but so my, you got, my, so your wife kind of eased you into the life, or did well, she just I, baptism by no, fire? I was really fortunate because my wife decided to, to get me involved with horses. She would do it the same way I did when it came to flying, which was to say, when I wanted her to fly, I didn't say, okay, you got to go polish the helicopter and you got to fill it up and you got to pre-flight it and anything like that. I'd say, just come fly with me. I just want to go get a thousand dollar hamburger with you. And she did the same for me with a horse. She didn't say that I had to tack it up or brush it or anything. All she What's said was, I'll have a horse ready for you. Just come ride that's love that's nice that's, that's love. it was yeah yeah and it was the way to get me hooked because the rest you know, of us got thrown into the to the manure pit what are you talking about <laughs> and and i didn't ride at, at when we met or i didn't ride much but my mom is a really well-respected horsewoman and even though she's in her 70s she still rides 50 mile endurance rides so uh, I re- okay so it was in your blood a little bit they just need to be you know awakened yeah, my I, my wife recognized the good riding genes. 
Yeah. And, uh, so, so she, she was an enabler with me. And, and of course, then <laughs> I've been involved with that. And, uh, she got me into Andalusian horses, which are a Spanish horse. And back then I thought, uh, it would be appropriate to go to Europe, which I did to learn the horse language in, in, in the dialect that it, it came from, meaning either Portugal or, yeah. or uh, Spain. And I found that the classical style of riding was so captivating that after I went a couple of times, I started a riding school near Lisbon, and I, and I still have that. It's called rideinportugal.com, where I help others that are interested in classical riding to have a chance to ride incredible Lusitano stallions. And a lot of people, for example, have never ridden flying changes or tempi changes. And you go to Portugal and go, oh, my God, I can actually do this. And you get the muscle memory and you come back. And it's a, it's a really enlightening experience. Jeez, Joseph, so, you don't jump into anything half, you know what. I, I, I don't. And that's true. <laughs> and that's one of the problems. And, and I can tell you because when you, when you are an inventor and you can see these these things that need to be improved upon, at least in my mind, um, you, you want to get into it. And so once I got started in, in the horses, yeah, I, I went into it pretty crazy, and I'm still crazy about it. So. All right. How many, I, Helena, how many horse husbands do you know that uh, want to go to Portugal to learn how to ride better? I, I want to go to Portugal to learn how to ride better. I like that whole shortcut. It's like liposuction for muscle memory. You go to Portugal, you ride an Andalusian, and you come back knowing how to do tempi changes. Come on. Yeah, or 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 half passes or shoulder ins or travers or any of the things that you keep reading about and you struggle with and you go over there and under the eyes of a watchful instructor and on a trained horse and you come back. I actually called my wife the first time and I said, oh, my God, honey, I know how to ride. Okay, here it is. I'm there for one week, and I'm calling her. And now it's 15 years later, and I still, you know, I'm just beginning to get this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about some of the inventions that will help our listeners. Okay, well, um, equity manufacturing. That's e q u i t e e m f g dot com. Equity manufacturing is a company that I developed to to sell horse products that will help make uh, horse keeping easier or, or safer. And um, I, I, I saw this, this reason for improvements of horse keeping, and, and, I, and I started going crazy trying to fix the shortcomings. So Equity provides um, fencing solutions for common horse fencing, like pipe panels, um, PVC fence, or T-posts. And uh, we found that horse fencing requires, and this is horse fencing versus cattle fencing, it requires three components to make it horse safe. And that would be physical strength, visibility, and a mental deterrent. And most fencing that's out there only has two of those needs. So we make the third one. And, and an example would be like pipe panel fencing, which is really strong and vi really visible, but you can't keep your horses from playing across it without having some kind of, of hot wire. And as you know, there's no way to put a hot wire on a pipe panel fence. At least that's what I found, so I invented a way. And we made a pipe panel clamp that lets you put one on. The same goes for PVC, where it's highly visible, which adds a good mental deterrent, but horses will run right through it without a hot wire or a poly rope. So we make a quick stud that goes on the face of a post and lets you put a hot wire on your vinyl fence. Uh -huh. And the third fence part we make is an adapter, and I know, Glenn, you're gonna put up some sort of a field fence, and field fence is great horse fencing, except the tops of the T-posts are exposed, and you can have an impalement from yes. that. Yes. And it's also not very visible, and, right. and you really need to have that visible deterrent. And so we make an adapter that fits on the top of the T-posts that lets you put a vinyl sight line on field fence. And so you get the visibility of PVC fencing without the expense of PVC fencing. And so those are the parts we make for the the fencing industry but we're best known actually for our manure forks and and uh, the one that helena has which is a, a standard tine it's called a, a flexen fork and the flexen fork came about because how many times have you brought home a shiny new manure fork only to have it snap a tine off the first time it caught on say a stall mat crack or hung up on a frozen manure ball and we found that on our ranch, some of the forks we were buying didn't even last a day. In fact, Diane bought three budget forks at a horse expo, and they all broke in the same day. 
So, and why is was, it when you break off a tine that one piece of poop that you try and pick up <laughs> just finds that hole every time? It is, is amazing. It? <laughs> it's amazing how the, the time that breaks is always in the center, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. That's true, too. That's true, too. It's, it's, it's never, never the, the end one. one. That's off to the side yeah. where you can work around it. So, that's yeah, we, we found that to be the case. Well, wait a minute. I have to say that the ones that break on me are the one, are the end ones. But, you know, those are the ones <laughs> I need the most because I need that fine control of the corner of my pitchfork. Uh, Forget the teeny kind of tiny obsessive food. about cleaning stalls. She's, and, and there I certainly is... One thing we found in in uh, the manure cleaning business is there's a million different ways to clean a stall. If you think that you're going to go in and make a video up and show somebody this is how to clean a stall, I'm here to tell you that there'll be a line of people telling you that that's not the way to clean it or that you're lazy or that you're inefficient. Well, my wife and I so, still disagree. On <laughs> yeah, and, so, I mean, how could that be? 25 years later. Area. <laughs> <laughs> she taught me, and we still disagree. Now, okay, so the Flex and Fork, the thing about this product, and and Helena can probably attest to this, is you're saying that these tines just don't break. Yeah, the tines, the, the reason they don't break, there's, there's two reasons why. We spend more money on a pound of plastic in its pellet form before we injection mold it than a regular budget fork costs at retail. And, and anybody knows that if you're going to buy something of quality, it's going to cost a little bit more to buy the raw material. So that's, that's the first reason why. But it also has a lever on the back of it, which acts like a built-in shock absorber, and that reduces the stress on the tines. And it's, and it's really hard to visualize this over the radio, I know, but maybe Helena can point it out. But it actually flexes as you're working it. So if you run it into something like a, a stall cracker, the side of, a, uh, of your pipe panel or something, it gives. And it's that little give that allows the tines to, to last so that they don't break. It would be like having a car that had no shock absorbers. Imagine how rough that would be inside. What's the same with a, with a manure fork? So that's, the, that's a quick and dirty explanation. So why do you like it, Helena? Why do you like it? Oh, my gosh. Let me count the ways. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had um, – uh, Joseph was kind enough to send me both forks, the motorized fork and then the manual flex and fork. And I, I tried and really liked both. I thought the flex and fork, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm really interested in the motorized thing, which is fabulous. And I'll let Joseph talk about that because sadly I did have to send it back. So I wasn't able to make it part of my my home forever. But I, I have become um, – I don't want to say addicted, but very attached to my flex and fork. What happened was um, my new quarter horse, who's a beefy young fellow, is very curious. And I had the pitchfork resting near the barn door one day. And he came into the barn uninvited and knocked over the pitchfork. And he's not the spooky kind. So once he knocked it over and it got under his feet, he proceeded to stand on it. And then yeah. after that, he decided he wanted to turn around on it. And gr- now he's wearing shoes, mind you, and grind it into the ground a little bit. And then, well, it kind of got stuck on his back foot. So he kicked his, kicked his back foot a little bit to shake it off. And he finally got, I mean, this horse couldn't get any more twisted up with a pitchfork. <laughs> Do you, you think picture the, this happening too. You, Oh, and the best part about it is he's just so calm. Like, what is this thing on my feet and underneath Quarter me? Horse. So he, so three out of his four feet had really stepped on the basket of this pitchfork and not and it's a not scrap. like these are invisible, right? I mean, They're it's bright, bright yellow. Bright yellow. <laughs> yeah, it isn't like the horse didn't know what it was doing at the time. No, bright yellow. He just, you know, was like, whatever, I'm not in a hurry to get away from this thing. It clearly doesn't eat horses. And, of course, I'm like, <gasps> that's the fork that's on loan to me. Oh, my God, you know. And then, so, uh, you know. I, I, I see this whole thing unfold before me, and I'm like, holy cow. That, that thing didn't – not a tine, broken, bent, nothing, okay? So then the next day – it's winter, mind you. Okay, so everything that's plastic is going to break. So I'm like, hmm, what else can I do to this fork? <laughs> Maybe what he said was true. So I take it out to my, my field, which hasn't been touched in weeks, and I proceed to pick the frozen manure. And I don't just pick it. I am driving this pitchfork at – the poopsicles because I'm determined now I get one load of frozen manure up. I'm determined to clean my entire field, no matter how frozen. And I probably picked up about 30 piles of manure. Yes. I told you it was a, it was a couple of weeks. 
again, and I'm slamming this pitchfork into the piles, nothing, not a bent tine, <laughs> not a crack, and nothing. And I think it's so funny because I've seen Helena do this. And when she, <laughs> when she gets her mind on something, and people that have <laughs> listened to this show for three years know this, there isn't anything that can stop her. She will break that pitchfork. To, to clean the poop. If cleaning the poop in that field at the, on this particular day, even if it's frozen, is the something Helena wants to do, she's going to do that thing. Well, it, eventually what happened is the pendulum su- swung back to that moderate level. And I said, I'm starting to really like this pitchfork. And I said, <laughs> I don't want to break it now because it's become valuable. But what I found was um, what I would do is I would switch. Now, it's ergonomic. So it's got a, a handle. On the end of it, that's with a slight sort of, bend. Yeah, it's it's with a slight bend, and yeah. um, now I'm small, so it's just a skosh too long for me. But what I did find is that if I I kept using that handle, it was great for providing leverage, physical like a right. a, a fulcrum, you know, leverage for lifting those really heavy. Um, piles of manure that you get out in the field, like in their stalls. Sometimes they mix them up; they're smaller piles, but. Um, so I just found it that that little extra bit of leverage, which I had completely discounted. I'm like, ooh, ergonomic handle, whatever. Yeah. I was surprised at how effective it was at getting somebody my height to really be able to lift that extra couple of pounds of manure. Um, the shaft was really light, so you, you know it's not any heavier than your typical pitchfork. And then when I went back to the conventional straight handled light wooden pitchfork, ugh, it was so weird. Now, part of that rigid. is yeah, it, because rigid. I had, but the thing is, is I hadn't been using the flex and fork long enough to forget what it felt like to use the traditional fork. It's not like I was so used to it that, you know, the conventional fork was strange to me, but I did find that I much preferred the ergonomic design to the conventional design. Again, surprise, surprise to me. And it's important. There, there are things called ergonomic forks out there which have a bit, which have a big bend to a shaft, and and those people don't like those for the most part. This has a regular straight shaft, so you can roll the thing over easily, but it has a slight bend to the grip, and that gives you what's called a neutral or natural wrist. So your wrist isn't bent, and then you don't get that carpal tunnel feeling in your wrist. So, we we get a funny word when people talk about the flex and fork in particular. People say they love their manure fork. And I didn't think that I'd ever have a product that you would get manure and love in the same <laughs> sentence. But, but we, hear, we hear that so often, and then we ask people to explain why so that we can, we can you know, say it in an ad. People don't know why they love it. They don't, they don't know the flex thing. They don't know the ergonomic thing. They don't know the fiberglass handle. They don't know any of that. It's just something is so different, and then they begin to protect it. Now, Helena, do you leave yours out where everybody can grab it, or do you kind of hide yours? Um, I leave it everywhere. Well, you're in your own barn, though. You're not at a boarding oh, okay. stable. She's not at a boarding no. stable. If you're at a boarding stable, you hide it. But the thing it is, is room. Well, yes, it's yeah. true. I would hide it. I hear I that so that. many times from people that say that they buy the thing and then they have to hide it because when they come by, they hate it when somebody's got their fork, you know. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to talk about all of these products. And, and one of the things I want to mention before we get off the Flex and Fork here, and, of course, over the next coming weeks, we're going to talk about the other products that you have as well, including the motorized fork, um, right. which, which I'm hoping to review here soon. Um, you... Uh, the, this one has two different baskets too. So if you, if you, depending on what kind of bedding you have. Yeah, we make it with a standard tine basket, which has a five eight spacing, and then we also make it with what we call a mini tine, or other people call a fine tine, which would be twenty seven um, tines, and that has a five sixteen spacing, which is just wide enough so that the, a pellet will fall through. But if you've got um, sawdust or mini mini flakes, rice hulls. Um, anything that's smaller, this is the way to do it. And it doesn't have a big basket. It's not uncomfortable. It doesn't turn over. Every product that we make is is built and tested for years, either on the ranch here or we have a core group of people from all over the country that are from the heat of Texas or the cold of North Dakota, and we, we give our parts hell before they ever go out to people. And we we do make parts that are a little bit more expensive. For example, the Flex and Fork is about 49 bucks. But in perspective, that's about half of what a set of shoes costs, right, for your horse. And unlike the shoes or a budget fork, it'll last a lot longer than eight weeks. And so it's a really good value. Oh, you'll go through two of the budget forks. Uh, two of the budget forks equal this one, but you'll go through those before this one ever breaks. Yeah, I mean, and, this and isn't going to break. 
So. Yeah, and it isn't just the, 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 the two forks to one. When you use one of our forks, it's a better experience. You, you, you will enjoy the – I mean, it's hard to believe. Helena's been with process. me for three years, and she doesn't love me yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's because you don't – you can't tackle frozen poop. Or maybe you can, but I don't know. Yeah, that's eat. right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's equitymfg.com, E-Q-U-I-T-E-E-M-F-G.com. And, of course, we'll put a link on our webpage, too. There'll be a big banner ad there. We're going to get to the Shake and Fork here in the coming weeks and some of your other products, too. I'd like to talk to you more about the fencing and things like that. And uh, we're going to be doing some fencing, so we can we can collaborate on that a little bit. But, uh that, uh, but Helena, right now, that was a great review for the Flex and Fork, and we'll be talking to you soon again, Joseph. And you're also joining us. We have our Horse Husbands episode coming up, and you dove in more than most, more, most Horse Husbands after you got involved. So I'd love you f- to join us on the Horse Husbands episode and talk about the pitfalls of being a Horse Husband, too, because th- you can't tell me it was all rosy. Oh no, there's there's still <laughs> yeah, there's still those moments, but the the good part is is the more you get involved with it, the more you understand what that passion is about and and it is one of the things that that as you're as you're involved, it has more rewards. Well, that's true. So, that is absolutely true. But we're going to talk it, about But that. when you're first starting out, you wonder what is going on with this. I heard somebody talking about socks. And I used to say the same thing about bridles. Why do you have to have so many bridles? <laughs> or bits. <laughs> or, or saddle bits, pads. Or, you know, or... or saddle. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. You all right, save it, side of the pack save it for the show, Joseph. We've got to save all that stuff. <laughs> all right, we'll okay. talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Equity Thank you. MFG.com. Well, again, we it's Equity Manufacturing. That's E-Q-U-I-T-E-E-M-F-G.com for all of those products. And we'll be telling you more about them in the weeks to come. Well, you have uh, Mike Blowen scheduled. He's from Old Friends. It's a uh, it's a retirement home for pensioned thoroughbreds. I love that term, pensioned thoroughbred. Yeah, it sounds very ooh la la. Yeah, it does. And it's a beautiful farm. It's, as, as we said, it's only about five miles from where Jennifer and I live, and we've been over there and had the tour and got to meet a bunch of the horses. So let's talk to him about how it came to be and, and what he's up to now. Welcome, Mike, to the Stable Scoop Radio Show. I'm really excited to learn about old friends. I don't know much about your organization. Um, I'm stuck here on the East Coast in that crappy New England weather, but Glenn has been out to visit you. Tell us a little bit about old friends and what you guys do there. Well, I remember all that New England weather because I spent most of my life in Boston. And how I ended up in Kentucky is the same way I think Alice fell down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> you never know where you're going to end up. Um, well, okay, uh, we came down to uh, Kentucky in 2001, Diane White, my wife, and I, and in 2003, we started all friends with one horse, a wonderful old mare named Narrow Escape, who's got the perfect name for the start of a group like this, and uh, she was left at Phasic Tipton when she didn't get a bid, and we got a call from Phasic Tipton asking us if we could take her, so we took her, so... Uh, that was in 2003. Now here we are in 2012. Uh, we take care of 116 retired thoroughbreds. Wow. Uh, they earned nearly $90 million on the track. Uh, we have more stakes winners here than any farm in the history of horse racing. Uh, we have horses that we had made 52 starts in the Breeders' Cup. Um, it's just amazing. So it's a, to me, it's like uh, for, uh, going from someone who never believed when I was younger that racehorses were athletes to realizing that they're that they're actually superior to the human counterparts. But this is like having Larry Bird and Michael Jordan in your yard. It's just yeah. unbelievable. So, we're so fortunate here. That's the best way I've ever heard it put. <laughs> Larry Bird you know, and Michael Jordan. They're just unbelievable. No, well, they, I'm reading through you know, some of these names, and it's like, you know, wow. I don't care if they're, you know, in their 20s and just hanging around eating grass. Just to watch them and know what they've accomplished is, you know, that's that's your sunrise every morning, huh? Well, you know, it's yes, it is. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I look out and I, you know, a fortunate prospect is 31, and they still run around. Uh, I watch Gulch run against Afternoon Delights every day. They select their own post time. <laughs> they don't need a rider or a saddle. Nobody bets on them, although that's an idea to raise money. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, that, that would, would actually. Uh, cool. <laughs> senior <laughs> races. We have the pensioned <laughs> racehorse race, and it's it's like a quarter mile long. 
And yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it could be like the senior golf tour. Exactly. Yeah, actually, a little slower, a little fatter, but you know, they still, you know, it's still nice to see that Sam Sneed could still swing a club in his dotage, you know. <laughs> and they can too. They still run and they exercise themselves, and they're very. You know, most of the really good ones that we have here are just really, really tough and very, very intelligent. How are they as keepers? Uh, you know, a lot of people who get the, their thoroughbreds off the track, it's, and thoroughbreds are notoriously difficult keepers, but in their retirement homes, do they, do they mellow out a little bit? I think that's a myth. I, 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 we've, you know, we get horses here with reputations. Uh, the first great horse we ever had donated to us was Ruhlman, the grade one winner that Jerry and Ann Moss had. And we got him just before Giacomo's Derby, uh, 2005, I guess. And um, he came with a terrible reputation that, you know, he almost killed a couple of guys. He might have killed one guy. They're not sure (laughs) they ever found him again. Uh, (laughs) But what happened in one incident, so Peggy Whittingham was telling me that he was the only horse that Charlie was afraid of. And uh, he was very, very tough. And he, it took two people to get him to the track. You know, he's a... He's a racehorse, and he didn't suffer fools gladly, and uh, he won a lot of really, really, really nice races. He would have been horse of the year, I think, the year that criminal type won, but he got injured. He actually beat criminal type twice that year. He's an amazing horse. But anyway, he, he, he apparently he was very difficult to run the track, and one day one of the grooms got mad and thought, well, I'll teach him a lesson. So he brought him into the barn, and he whacked him around a little. And for two weeks, I guess, Ruhlman was like a puppy dog. But one day, when nobody else was around, he turned into the stall, and he attacked the guy and tore his stomach out. Mm. So um, Jay Hovde uh, never would believe this, but after uh, Ruman was here for about 10 months, we gave a lot of tours. He settled down. Uh, we didn't put the shank over his nose. We just let him with a little lead rope. And I think after a while, he lost that fear aspect, and he wasn't a terror anymore. And I got him to the point where I didn't do it. Everybody did it together, but... I could go out into the paddock and feed him a couple of carrots, and he would roll over and let me scratch his stomach. Oh, wow. And it, it happens to all these horses. We had, you know, I talked to the people that trained Ball 4, for example, and Julian Le Peru, and they all talked to me, told, told me what a bully he was and everything. Well, when we put him out with a, with a few of our geldings, uh, he's now last on the totem pole. They just, taught, they just said, hey, listen, that, that stuff doesn't work with us, and <laughs> yeah. you're last on the totem pole now, buddy. <laughs> So Bonapaw and some of the other, uh, and uh, Kudos, if you remember Kudos, that Mandela had Kudos as the leader of that paddock, and he wasn't going to take any nonsense from this newcomer. So, <laughs> so it's they, very interesting to see thoroughbreds become horses again, not just race horses. Well, that's the big question, yeah. I mean, they go, you know, there's, there's so much that can be bred into them. There's so much hotness and aggression that can be bred into them. But then you have to kind of wonder, well, when you change their environment so drastically, you you have to expect that their personalities are going to change as well. And, you know, that's the other nice thing I think you get to see is that these guys, and these are the top of the top, you know, not that any, they're all great. All racing thoroughbreds are amazing, but these are, like you said, the Michael Jordans of their sport. And so they're even more, you know, they're even bred more tightly to be fast and hot and thoroughbred. And very smart and very tough. And that's the interesting, I mean, we do have horses here that didn't earn anything. We have, uh, when I was when I, back in Boston, I used to review movies for the Boston Globe, and the great movie director John Houston told me once, "You don't have a movie unless you have a star." And I thought, "Well, we got the stars, but we need the supporting cast too." So we have some horses here that literally didn't earn a dime. Or we have a horse here named Swan's Way, who's right next door to Afternoon Delights, and right across from Patton in Marquetry. And, and he, the poor guy, raced until he was 15 years old, and he only earned sixty-three thousand dollars. So. Mm. But he raced until he was 15. That you know, that's yeah, what he certainly earned his retirement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you don't yeah. ride them any of them either. These are truly in retirement at your place. Yes, yes. Now we have some exceptions. If we get a really, really young horse off the track that just needs a year off to rehab and to take care of any injuries and everything, you know, if, if they're six or seven years old, you know, it's kind of early to get them totally retired. So. Janet Byersdorfer, who runs uh, that part of our operation, uh, evaluates them along with our veterinarian, Dr. Byers, and if they're fit enough and interested enough, then we do some retraining. But we don't adopt them out. We always keep ownership of the horse, and people can, uh, can come and take them to horse shows and work with them here and do some things, uh, but we keep an eye on all of them. So, so you, it's sort of it's like a free well so far. 
Yeah, we have. Uh, do you remember Smokey Stover? No. Smokey Stover yeah. ran in the Breeders' Cup in New Jersey when it was at Monmouth Park. Uh, he's a beautiful big black horse and a millionaire. Greg Gilchrist had him out in California. And uh, he won grade one races and everything. And now he's one of the great dressage horses you'll ever see. Aww. And your horses don't only really come from the United States either. They come from all over the world. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do, Glenn. Um, we, after what happened to Ferdinand over in Japan, uh, we got a hold of Emmanuel Desaru, who is uh, one of the guys that, that markets these horses overseas. And he arranged for us to create this kind of viaduct between us and Japan uh, as far as the horses are concerned. So they, they call us and let us know uh, when horses are being ready to, to end their breeding career over there, and then we raise the money and bring them back. Uh, we've brought home five so far, a horse named uh, Creator, who was once owned by Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, he came home with Sunshine Forever, who won the Eclipse Award as turf champion in 1988. And then we brought Fraze, uh, Madeline Paulson's horse, who won the Breeders' Cup turf, uh, back with, with Ogaijin, one of the greatest horses ever in the second look. And then... Uh, the, the latest one we brought home with the help of Cot Campbell and everybody at Dogwood Stable and his friends, uh, we brought home a great son of Gulch, uh, Walenda. And we have, we have Gulch at the farm and Walenda. And we have Afternoon Delights and his son, Popcorn Delights, who plays Sea <laughs> Biscuit in the movie. I tell people when they come on the tours that, uh, you know, with the economy and the state it's in, a lot of these youngsters are moving back in with their parents. So. <laughs> well, it's the only farm in the world where we have we have five pairs of fathers and sons. <laughs> what do you have? Um, what else? Do you, there's the facility in Kentucky, but you also have something in New York as well. Is Old Friends expanding? Yes, uh, we have a wonderful farm in New York. Uh, it's run by Mark and Joanne Pepper. It's right outside Saratoga in Greenfield Center. We have some wonderful New York champions up there, well, international champions in some cases. Uh, Will's Way won the Travers and the Whitney. Uh, Crusader Swords up there retired. Uh, Thunder Rumble, another Travers winner's up there. We also have one of my favorite horses of all time, Zippy Chippy, who's <laughs> over 100. Okay. He's, he's, got, he's banned from every racetrack in the country, including the Great Barrington Fair. So Because... <laughs> He's because he's so, he's, he's so futile. Yeah. <laughs> because he, he was considered a danger to the wagering public. <laughs> it's so terrible. He'd always, you know, towards the end of his career, after People Magazine named him one of the 50 most interesting personalities of the year, people used to come and bet on him and then keep the ticket. So he'd always go off at like 3 to 5 or 4 to 5 <laughs> and finish so up the far. track. Well, I wanna, but he's, we a, he's, a, he's a wonderful horse, and his motto is, Winners don't always finish first. So. Aww. He's come to terms with his futility. All right, I have an idea for you. I, I'm, I'm clicking That's through funny. your website as we're having this conversation here. I have an idea for you on how to raise money. <laughs> Because you need more. Oh, that's you need more fabulous. Ideas. Okay, you ready? This is it. Shh, yes. Nobody else listen. Everybody else don't take this idea. I think you can take, even the old guys, you go, go all the way to, you can, you can pimp out your horses as models. That's a great idea. Isn't that a great idea for yes. horse magazines, well, for fashion designers? They can come to the farm, use the farm for their photo shoots, gloss up your horses. Voila, sitting fee. You know, I love it. Just saying. That's a great idea. You know, uh, we uh, we just got our first briar horse. Oh, did you? Uh, we, we, we have a marvelous horse here named Bull in the Heather. It was Ferdinand's greatest uh, offspring. He won the 1993 Florida Derby. He's a and, gray, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Phil Johnson had him. I'm sorry, Howie Tesher had him. Uh, and uh, I told Howie, if he'd had a better trainer, he would have won more races, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, uh, he got his own briar horse this week, so it's really neat, and they're donating part of the proceeds to all friends. Oh, well, that's great. Well, yeah. speaking of proceeds, we need to take a quick break here for a commercial, and we're going to be back. I want to find out how a movie guy up there doing doing movie reviews in Boston, working for the paper up there, doing the beat, um, ended up, you know, loving and liking uh, racing so much, enough to end up with 100 horses of your own. We're going to find that out in just a minute. Howdy, everybody. Glenn the Geek back with you. I am with Debbie from Equestrian Collections with the Equestrian Collections Product of the Week, and we're going breeches this week. 
This week, I wanted to talk about the Tough Rider Ladies Rib Knee Patch Breeches. And the reason I picked these out is because I think these are some of the best middle-of-the-line breeches. They're great. You can show in them if you want. Um, you can also, they're great for trail riding. These breeches are fabulous all-around breeches. They're the, our biggest seller, they're my, the most comfortable breech I've ever worn. And the fun thing about these is they come in a gazillion colors for fun, especially this in the spring. You might want to wear purple. They have those. There's all kinds of colors. The sizes are very comfortable. They um, are, are stretchy without being tight, and they come in knee patch, and they come in low rise and regular rise, and they also come in full seat. Well, I think you're right. These make a great uh, medium, sort of medium level breach at under 50 bucks. And I want to read a little review that Tricia wrote on your website. She said, these breeches are very good quality, fit well, and have a high level of comfort. The material is soft and the ribbing makes these appear much more expensive than they are. That's a great review. Yes, yes, we're always happy to hear from our customers. I wanted to say that, too. On your website, on Equestrian Collections, you, you can read all the reviews. It's one of the cool things about shopping over there. And you can find these Tough Riders Ladies Rib Knee Patch Riding Breeches at EquestrianCollections.com. Just search for Tough Rider Ladies Breeches, and you'll find them on there, along with the entire Tough Rider line of breeches, which they have some terrific products in addition to these. Check them out at EquestrianCollections.com. And we're back, and we're speaking to Mike, who is the president and founder of Old Friends in Kentucky here, not too far from where I live. And you have a horse there that a lot of people in the audience have met, and they haven't met him at Old Friends. They met him at the Kentucky Horse Park because he was in the all, the Breeds Barn for a lot of years that I remember, and that's a firm success. I cannot believe that horse is still alive, first of all. Oh, he's doing great. You know uh we have, you know, Richard Schausberg had him, Richard Migliori rode him, and they came to the farm a while back, and it's going to be, uh, and it was a day that Richard was at Keeneland riding, and he had one of the worst days of his career. I think he was on the, all four of the horses, the three of the four horses he rode were favorites. Uh, the fourth one was the second choice, and two of the, of the three favorites were going off at less than even money, and I think he only finished in the money on one horse, or maybe he finished fourth on one of them. So he was coming out of the, the, the track, and I said, Richard, I, uh, you don't know me. I said, my, my name's Michael Blown, but I have, I have two of my, your favorite horses at my farm. He says, who do you have? And I said, a firm success in Hidden Lake. And he absolutely freaked out. And he said, oh, I'd love to see him. So we hopped in his car, and off he came. And he spent, uh, he didn't leave until you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And it was because of a firm success and because of Hidden Lake. And then who he's talking about, that horse. Helena, a fabulous is, horse. is the Mig Miglieri. He had, and his nickname was the Mig, and he is a yeah. regular, he's actually a regular guest on our morning show, on Horses in the Morning. He, he's, he really, you know, a lot of, you know, there's only a handful of these, of the jockeys that really care about what happens to these horses, and he's right at the top of the list. The MIG's very proud. He has a new, uh, he, he talks about it every time he comes on the show. He has a new horse of his own. He got himself a trail horse. <laughs> so he, he's oh, riding the trail. He's not now. riding it, is he? Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> he better not fall off him. He's, 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 got some, he's got some bad things going on. He better not... <laughs> fall off that horse, I'll tell you that much. Mm. He can't keep away from him. I know, it's like a disease. I think it's like a walking horse, though, Mike, so I think he's safe. <laughs> okay, good. I hope so. Just bubble wrap him up. Me nervous. Yeah. Just bubble wrap him so up. You, you said you were a movie guy. Which paper up there were you working for? Uh, the Boston Globe. Uh huh. And you did movies the whole time, or were you on the beat uh, part of the time, too? No, I, I did. Uh, I, I covered movies for most of the time there, and I the, the the greatest job I ever had actually was covering stand-up comedy because all you had to do was drink and laugh. <laughs> it was fabulous. That's a, now that's a job for you, Glenn. I know. I like that job. That's you actually a, have to then job. write about it. The, the problem is remembering what you saw the night before. <laughs> yeah, you, you know they didn't give enough space to really make too many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> That's then, but see, these days they just give you an assistant. Yes. Yeah. Oh, they do. No, I think that nowadays they hardly have anybody working there. Probably from what the time you were there, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it was a great time to be there. We had, a, you know, uh, that's where I met my wife, Diane White. She was a columnist there, and you know, the sport. You know, Bob Ryan was covering the NBA, and Peter Gammons was covering the Red Sox, and Willie McDonough was covering the, 
you know, the Patriots and Bud Collins was covering tennis. I mean, it was it was fabulous. I mean, wow, those were the really days. Great. Those are big yeah, days. Yeah, that was really something, I have to say. That, that was when it was like cool to be from towards. Boston, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great time. I, I don't regret a minute of it. It was really, really fun. Well, now, were you a racing, a horse racing fan back then? Well, there was a connection. No. Uh, I had an editor at the Globe, uh, Robert Taylor, who died recently. He's a great, great editor. And, and when I first started these reviews, I'd come from an academic background. I was teaching filmmaking at Emerson College and at Boston University. And so when I went into the newspaper thing, I was very patronizing to some of the films, and I thought I was smarter than everybody. You know, I was young, and I taught college. You know, yeah. a terrible yeah, combination. Yeah, yeah. You knew that, yeah. So, and you were from Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It was, it was terrible. It was, a, it was a deadly trifecta. But um, Mr. Taylor, I, I wrote a review of a movie called Hot Lead and Cold Feet, which is a mediocre movie with uh, Don Knotts and Tim Conway, that crew. A really cheesy Walt Disney movie. And, um, and I wrote this review, and I kissed it off. And Bob Taylor was an uh, arts editor, and, and he called me, and he goes, Michael, do you have a second? I said, yeah. And he went over that review in about five minutes, and he, he made a mediocre review of a mediocre movie. He made it sing. And I said, holy mackerel. This is like watching somebody do one of those Rubik's Cubes in like ten seconds. And uh, I said, I've got to hang around with this guy. Well, a couple of weeks later, he called me and said he and a bunch of his friends were going to go to the racetrack. And I'd never been to the racetrack. I ended up going to Suffolk Downs and having a ball. I liked the people. I liked the horses. I liked the betting. I liked the fun. I mean, I really, really liked it. I liked, really liked the challenge of handicapping. Well, years and years went by, and as, as things would happen, I decided that the one thing I was missing was I didn't know anything about horses. And so I, I, I found an old trainer that I had written a story about for Spur Magazine many years ago. His name was Carlos Figueroa. He was known as the, the king of the fairs. And I went to work for Carlos for a couple of years and uh, as a groom and as a hot walker and as anything else. And I just fell in love with the animals. I mean, oh, that's a quick way to learn. Was such a thrill. Mm-hmm. That's, that's and, a quick and it was get... good learning from the bottom up and not getting yeah. paid and all that kind of stuff because there was nothing interfering with it. You know, this is the, you knew right away whether this is going to this is going to uh, attract you or not. And then you know, and then unfortunately, you see what happens to these horses, these old geldings in particular, they couldn't race anymore, and uh, you know, they were just sent off to the killers, and that was the end of it. And bring in some new ones, and you know, run them into the ground, and bring in some new ones, and and that was kind of like the deal. So I thought if I ever had the opportunity to. Um, do something about it, I'd take a shot at it. And as luck would have it, years later, uh, I had retired from the uh, Globe, and I was a big supporter of the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, and I had some movie memorabilia, and I brought it to them for their auction, and in the middle of that transaction, they asked me if I wanted to work as their operations director. So when I first came to Kentucky in 2001, I worked for a year and a half as the operations director for the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. I learned a lot from, from that experience, too. Wow. And that's kind of like now, we got, as I say, started with one horse. Now we got 116 and a waiting list of more than 70. And we're trying wow. to balance the ones that really need the home from people that don't have the money to take care of them anymore with the, with the, with the stars. Because the... the, the the ones that really deserve the retirement, you know, they don't necessarily make the news, and they're not the stars. But you need the the stars to make the news to draw attention to everybody else. So we try That's to different. we try to balance it out. We just got that wonderful horse, Arson Squad, from Samantha Siegel. Uh, Arson Squad was one of those horses that broke down at Gulfstream Park a month and a half ago or two months ago. Mm. They, I think three of them broke down during workouts. Anyway. She's amazing. Here's this older, older gelding, eight or nine years old. He won the swap stakes. He beat Brother Derek. I mean, he beat a lot of nice horses. And, uh, and she paid a lot of money to have his surgery done. It was done over here at Root and Riddle by Dr. Bramlage. And, and then she uh, wanted to retire him to old friend. So, so he's here doing his post-op work. He's, he'll be off the tour for another few weeks. But I hope when the spring comes, by the time the derby comes, he'll be greeting all of his fans. Well, and, you uh, have he's been he he's been adopted by the Lexington Fire Department. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, Arson Squad. Great. Yeah, oh, it works out know. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> works out works out very well. <laughs> I wouldn't mind being adopted by the local Arson Squad either. <laughs> yeah, they're very <laughs> not. Other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Oh my goodness. You have something coming up tomorrow night too. It's a big fundraiser for you guys, don't you? Yes, tomorrow night at the Seelbach Hotel. This is one of our the, the really great events. It's a, it's a lot of fun, and I can say it's great because I really have very little to do with it. 
uh, between the Seelbach and the distillers and all of our uh, volunteers put this thing together. It's called Old Friends Along the Bourbon Trail, and the Kentucky distillers that run the Bourbon Trail come with all their newest bourbons, and they, they lay them all out there, and they, everybody can sample their wares. Uh, fortunately, the hotel uh, kicks in uh, half price rooms, so nobody has to drive under the influence uh, after the party's over. And we have a, we have a really nice dinner, and then uh, we have a silent auction and a live auction of all kinds of great uh, racing me- uh, memorabilia and uh, vacations and all kinds of other things so we can raise the, raise the money. So it's really a lot of fun. And if anybody's around, I think there's a few tickets left, and they can call the Seelbach Hotel if they, uh, if they decide at the last minute they'd like to attend. That's the Seelbach Hilton Hotel, and, and that's in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, not, uh, p- uh, right off the Bourbon Trail. The one thing I found about trying to do the Bourbon Trail the one day and, and going to these tastings is, after, for me, after about three you know, tastes of bourbon, they all start to taste the same. I don't know if that's just me or... No, no, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You know, and at these tastings, Helena, they always have you taste the lesser bourbon first, and then you go to the medium bourbon, and then you go to the high-end bourbon. And I'm going, by the time I get to the high end, it just tastes the same. You know, it's like, give me the good stuff first, and then let's yeah. go to the lesser stuff. That's the way they do it in bars, you know. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's what we should do. I'm going to advise them that that's I'm a lightweight, you know. <laughs> give me, give yes, me the good you stuff are. first. Yes, but you are. Be, you can't even handle you know, sugar. <laughs> You know the other, the the you know we we're very very fortunate. We have uh, the other thing is we have uh, right before the Derby on the Thursday before the Derby we have Ferdinand's Ball in Louisville and it's the only fundraiser there that's totally dedicated to the horses. Uh, last year, uh, Demarcus Cousins, a Kentucky star who now plays for the Sacramento Kings, came, and uh, a woman named Katie Upton came and and she was very very nice she loved the horses and everything a very young young lady and uh i was watching the today show on monday and there she was on the today show i said to my wife diana said look there's katie upton on the today show and she's the cover girl for the sports illustrated swimsuit issue see and there. i talked about that last week and helena made fun of me you had to bring yeah, it up there you, Mike. Go. you had to bring <laughs> I'm it sorry. up i'm sorry this is going to be like four or five episodes now we're going to have to be <laughs> well, hearing about I, this well, I got to tell you, it's the only way we can get the jockeys to come to our parties. That's right. fine. I'm gonna That's put, fine. I'm going to put her on. Uh, I'm going to put her on mute here for a second, Mike. Is she as hot in person as she was on the in the cover? She's, she's. I'm too old for that. I mean, you know, that's another thing I have in common with these horses. I had to figure out what I was going to do when my racing and breeding career was over, too. <laughs> I'm too old for this kind of talk. I'll have a heart attack. Oh, boy. I'm this, telling you, it's terrible, isn't it? This is oldfriendsequine.org, and people, if they want to donate, they can do it there as well, right? Yes, yes, that would be that would be absolutely great. And we we really the most important thing is for people to come visit these horses. We like you know the weather's starting to switch here now. It's starting to get a little nicer, and and we'd love to show people the the horses. And we give tours every day at ten, one, and three, uh, every day but Sunday. At Sunday we do the tour at eleven o'clock. So um, we'd love to have people come and visit and share their stories of these guys. And you know we show them some of the races that they had so they're not just looking at a bunch of horses in the field they're 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 really getting to see them uh, running their youth in the on the video and then and then see them in person it's kind of a thrill well i think i'm very happy that you you joined us today i'm going to go out to facebook and tell all my friends to go look up your website and see what's going on, get to know some of the horses that you have. And then to support you, there's you know about six or seven different ways that uh, you have listed on your website that people can help. And like you said, one of those is traveling out there. Uh, whereabouts is Georgetown, Kentucky in relation to in between like Lexington and Louisville? Where is it? Yes, it's between Lexington and Louisville, very close to Lexington. We're only about 15 miles from Lexington. All right. So you and know what? That's... If anybody out there listening is planning on going to Rolex this year, Stop off and, you know, check out old friends. Make it a trip. I mean, Lexington and Kentucky in general is beautiful in the spring. Make sure it's you stop by gorgeous. and see some of these these amazing horses. And look for Mike and, you know, just give him a big fat hug and say thanks. Because, you know, these horses, I, I'm sure they say thank you in their own way. Most of them do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, that, said, that's why I said in their own way. And on that, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> 
Glenn. Thank you. Helena, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Best to everybody at Horse Racing Net- at Radio Network. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Well, that's terrific. Mike is a great great guy and talk about you know giving your heart over to something that uh you you sort of committed to earlier in your life he did it well i just like the fact that that you know it's he's not out there like oh you know these horses are abused and it's awful and blah 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 he's just you know said okay let's get some land get these horses in here make connections and do something i really like that he's looking forward instead of whining about he had a hundred some horses (laughs) That's a lot of horses. That's a lot. I would love to see old friends, quote unquote, franchise. So they've got Kentucky, they've got New York. I'd like to see that, you know, this way more lands and more horses can be retired, right. pensioned. He had I run really out like of land here, I know, and was uh, utilizing other farms. Um, but, you know, he just has a good heart. You can tell how he loves these horses. And he loves what, – what else he loves is the backstory to the horses. He really it, likes their backstory. There is a respect there. Yeah. There's a respect yeah. that even I think some – I'm going to get flamed for this, but some rescue organizations that they, they don't have, they do they, – some people just want to stop abuse or neglect. He has such a deep respect for the athlete. And, and he doesn't hate and the racing. People who he can- likes racing. Yeah. yeah, and it's, you know, and it shows. I think it just shows in when you come from that place where he's coming from, you are um, you can target your efforts to do to be I, effective. And I totally just, understand. I get flamed every time. You know, we adopt greyhounds. We have our second adopted greyhound now, and I get flamed every time when I'm at a greyhound function when people th- talk about getting rid of greyhound racing, and I'm going, I don't want them to get rid of greyhounds. I like greyhound racing. If it's done by re- respectable, uh, reputable trainers, just like in horse racing, mm-hmm. if they treat their animals right, these animals, when, when I bring my, do- my greyhound to the dog park and she runs with other dogs, she is never, ever, ever happier than when she's running at 35 miles an hour at a dead run. Yeah, she comes back, and you saw the pictures I posted on Facebook there uh, of her running that my friend took. With those amazing shots she got in the first place of a dog oh. going thirty-five miles an hour, <laughs> but that look on her face—that was pure happiness and pure joy. Yeah. So I, you know, I do believe that that the greyhounds, especially, they love to run. They love racing. Now, you know, we have to make sure they're not mistreated in between the races. That's the part. That's the problem. That, yes, yeah. horses too. They love racing. You know right. me. I yeah. just, I don't mind racing. I just wish they wouldn't race babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you and, know, do you know, all those surgeries and stuff to fix them when they're foals. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of things like that. And but you know that, um, you know, let's fix those problems. Let's not get rid of it altogether because I do think that you know, especially these greyhounds. Plus, I wouldn't own a greyhound. Because they wouldn't breed these greyhounds. These greyhounds that are bred for racing are different than the greyhounds that are bred for you to have in your house. Yeah. Um, or for showing. They're different dogs. And, and, you know, we just fell in love with the racing greyhounds. They're so much fun, yet they're so calm 90% of the time. You know, so, uh, yeah, anyway, now I'm off on my soapbox now. I, but I, I get flamed for, for the same reason, uh, you know, because I come out and say that. Um, but anyway, well, let's here take he a is. break. It's, it's old friends, equine, and, and that was Mike Blowen. And, uh, yeah, we're going to take a break We're going to take what? a break for Kentucky Performance Products, and then we're going to come back and hear about our experience with the Illuminated Hoof Pick. Not every horse needs a supplement, and selecting the right supplement for your horse can be a science. Kentucky Performance Products simplifies your search for the right supplement, and they provide products that are scientifically developed to address the specific problems facing modern horses. Their website and customer service people can give you detailed information on each supplement, helping you find the right solution to your horse's problem. You can trust Kentucky Performance Products supplements to provide the ingredients you need in effective amounts so your horse gets the most out of each scoopful. Kentucky Performance Products, helping you keep your horses healthy, sound, and competitive. Visit them at kppusa.com. That's kppusa.com. Well, this is sounding like an old Tack and Habit show today, Helena. We're talking about products. We're not going to do a Tack and Habit segment today because we talked so long about, the, uh, about your pitchfork you love. That really was a Tack and Habit segment. But you did one with uh, Jennifer about uh, two weeks ago, the Illuminated Hoof Pick. 
which yes. we had found at the Ada show we went to. And all it is is it has an LED light on the end of the hoof pick so that when you're picking the horse's hoof, you can see it in it because you can never see in the darn hoof because the light's always in the wrong place in the barn. <laughs> well, we had a horse uh, that we're taking care of, a thoroughbred, retired thoroughbred actually, come up completely lame on Sunday. When we were out doing the barn, this horse was about three-legged lame and had a very fat ankle. And we were thinking, oh, no, tendon, you know, something permanent. It's going to take six months to heal. And Jennifer did the whole hose thing, and she put the liniments on, and she wrapped it and everything. Next morning, she goes out, and she says, I'm cleaning this horse's hoof. You know, the ankle went down a little bit, but not much. I'm cleaning the horse's hoof, and I'm really digging in because we have had so much mud here yep. that their hooves have been just packed every day. She said, I finally got really deep into the frog. I noticed that I could go deeper than usual, and she said, I... With my illuminated hoof pick, I was actually able to see into the frog of the foot and see a tiny glisten. And she said, I dug and dug and dug in there, and she found a perfectly round stone about the size of a pea. And she would have never seen it or or even found it other than the illuminated hoof pick. Wow. So so she dug this thing out of there because she just could see the very top of it. (laughs) And when she popped it out, a pile of pus came flowing out of the foot. And the next day, uh, she goes out, and there's a second hole that's opened up at the back of the foot. This was a channel. Um, so we got this abscess out, and all the swelling went down the leg. Horse is fine. A day later. Holy cow. Yep, and it was thanks to the illuminated hoof pick to actually get light under there to be able to see in. And uh, so I'm just, this is a product we reviewed a couple days ago. I'm just doing a follow-up. The thing, it has a value, and it works. <laughs> and so. I need to go get one. Fine. <laughs> Fine. And I have to say, though, you know, your wife has had tremendous success looking to the hoof for many, many lameness issues. I mean, and I don't mean that a lot of people go, oh, well, obviously, but um, there have been quite a few occasions where there's been this mystery lameness and swelling and uh, it really, all it took was just a little extra digging around in the hoof. And I love that she does that. But I mean, she does it because experience tells her, (laughs) dig a little deeper. And yet you would have never guessed it by this horse's fat ankle, you know, that we were going to be dealing with a hoof issue. Yeah. You know, we were thinking tendon or something like that. Um, wow. Well, yeah. And now you've had Martin, who you just talked about, who played with the pitchfork one day. Um, and our quarter horse is fun, by the way. Oh, my goodness. I am in love with this fellow. He is just, he's awesome. He's everything that I need in a horse right now. He's everything that I need. Um, Just And, you know, there's so much that he's just coming six years old. He's 15, three hands. He's a dark, dark, dark bay with four white socks. I really wouldn't couldn't care less what he looks like, but he's as fancy as he is sweet. He's dead quiet under saddle. (laughs) It's I mean, dead quiet. Poor Greasy can't even get him to go forward. (laughs) She gets on him and he just does a turn on the forehand. It's really cute. She's like, Mommy, look, I can do a turn on the forehand. (laughs) Um. But he's just, you know, I let him out to the backfield today by himself. Just, you know, first time he's been away from Zeke and let him out to the backfield. He can't see anybody. And he just walked along quietly. I turned him out. He doesn't, you know, kick or run or buck or anything when you unhook the lead rope. He stands quietly. And he'll go and eat, graze some grass. You know, he self-exercises. He'll, he'll just sort of get the wind up his skirts and then he'll run around, but he doesn't run around so crazy that he falls. Right, right. You know, he's good for the farrier and um, just really an all around and, and a comfortable ride. I cantered for the first time on him on Monday. And uh, I, I had cantered other horses since my leg injury, but this was the first time I had cantered this new guy with my weak leg in my own field, my own house. And I was practically in tears because he's such a smooth ride, <laughs> such a smooth ride. If Pi is a Ferrari, Martin is station wagon, an, minivan. He's an he's an Escalade. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's a luxury SUV. I thought you were going to say a minivan. No, he's a totally tricked out SUV. <laughs> yeah, that's Martin. That's exactly what it is. But today I was just thinking, you know what? Um, I am now a, a backyard horse owner. That's it. I'm, I'm a mom. I have kids. I have pets. I have stuff going on. 
what do you need in a back? You know, I don't need that competitive jumper or fox hunter. I need a good, solid, all around horse who you can turn out by himself. Which is why you know? we ended up with Beaker because Jennifer was done with the years of showing and, and competing and riding and, you know, crazily through the, the first field of a fox hunt. And it was like she just, same as you now, she just wanted to go out. And when she went out to the barn, she didn't want to spend an hour and a half fussing. And no time riding. She wanted to just be able to get on and ride and not have to think about it and have some brain-free time. And that's what you have now. Yeah. And, and it's, um, you know, it's hard to let go of that old competitive person, that athlete in me, you know, and say, oh, well, I've always been an athlete and I'm, I have a competitive goal-oriented personality, especially when I'm in the saddle. So to let that part of my life go and embrace a horse who re- represented this new chapter in my life was a really it was a, a very personal and very significant transition for me. However, the light at the end of that long tunnel is extremely bright because the joy that you feel in just being able to ride and play with your horse and not have the challenges of constantly training or worrying or you know, you don't have to always be on. And I wanted to just say to any listeners out there who who really, you know, you're attached to your horse, you love your horse, but you think, well, maybe he's just too much for me or he, she's just not trained enough or whatever. Your challenge might be is it's okay to reassess who you are and what your riding wants are. Not necessarily your riding goals, but what are your wants? And it's okay to find something that fits that because it's all about happiness. We ride horses to make us happy. So I, I found that, and I hope you guys will just kind of open your eyes and think about what makes you happy as well. There you go. Well, very good. Sounds like you fell in love with more than just your pitchfork. I did. <laughs> I fall in love with everything. I mean, <laughs> the tree, you know, a rock, a tree, the cat, whatever, the UPS guy, you know. Hey, be sure, everybody, to listen again next week as we have another episode of Stable Scoop. We're hoping to have something fun. I can't say what it is yet. Uh, We have an announcement to make next week. Uh, I have an announcement to make next week. My wife and I have an announcement to make next week. Uh, Drum roll! We're trying to to arrange a guest that will help us make the announcement. So we're going to hopefully do that next week. We'll let you know. You're not pregnant, are you? (laughs) No, I'm not pregnant, and neither is my <laughs> wife. We're a little too old for that now. I'm turning 50 in April. 50. <gasps> oh, 50 is the new 30. I'm going to be 50. 50 is the new 30. I feel like I'm 16 still, so my wife says I act like I'm 16. So I think You do. All right. Yeah. And I think everybody knows the end of the show part, you know? Let's skip yes. it today. Let's, Let's just say we'll be back next week. Thank you for a great show, and thank you for lining up such a wonderful guest and, and, and for him being here today and taking that time out of his 100 horses. Yeah, I know. That was pretty nice, you know? Hey, I'm good under pressure. That's it for this week, Alina. There will be more next week. Thanks for listening.